following lecture by Dr. Gordon H. Clark is entitled John Frame and Cornelius Van Til. Well, I have this material from a paper which John Frame wrote. The title is The Problem of Theological Paradox. That's the title of Frame's paper. And you will find it in Foundations of Christian Scholarship, edited by Gary North, published by Rothschild Books. Uh, here is the trouble. I hope you won't be too confused, but I'm pretty sure you'll be confused somewhat. Uh, as you know, Van Til has written a number of books. Well, then... Uh, Frame comes along and explains uh, certain important points in Van Til. So we have Van Til, then we have Frame's interpretation of Van Til, and then there are my remarks about Frame. And if you can keep the three people separate, you may be able to get through this, but, uh, well, anyhow, we'll begin. Uh, I, I think you can, if you listen, you can tell when I quote Van Til and when I quote Frame and when I give my own opinions. But remember, there are three people in view. Well, uh, Frame, uh, near the beginning of his paper, remarks that Van Til does not merely paraphrase Dutch theologians his apologetic position is unique and has been of substantial importance. Now, that frames opinion of Van Til, a commendatory opinion, and he says that Van Til has added things to the Dutch views, and uh, these are of substantial importance. Now, a quotation from Frame. Uh, his major complaints, by his framing Van Til, his major complaints against competing apologetic methods are that they compromise the incomprehensibility of God. Uh, make a little remark there. Uh, as you know, there has been a rather a theological upheaval at Westminster in the recent past over Professor Shepherd, and uh, I have read some of the published material, and uh, the, the actual doctrine which is under discussion with Dr. Shepherd is the doctrine of justification by faith. But those who are opposing him have tried to tie this in with the doctrine of the incomprehensibility of God. I think this is one of their pet themes at Westminster, and they drag it in whenever they think they can, even though it doesn't have much bearing on the subject matter. And uh, the frame, uh, <coughs> frame reports what Van Til says, and it's very accurate. His major complaint against competing apologetic methods are that they compromise the incomprehensibility of God. Now... Uh, when you get into a, a discussion, I was going to say a brawl, like this, uh, please remember that I always insist on your defining your terms. Uh, Van Til doesn't always do so, and Frame does it less. Uh, you ought to realize that what Van Til means by incomprehensibility is not what Charles Hodge means by incomprehensibility. There are two very different views, different definitions, though I hate to say two different definitions because the Westminster people really don't define incomprehensibility, but they do explicitly reject Hodge's view. They don't use the term Hodge, but I mean they give his definition and say it's no good. So uh, there are complications, and if you want to learn the subject, you have to learn the complications. That's what the subject is. 
And if you don't want to learn the subject, won't go out and play golf. I don't know why anybody would want to do so, but apparently some do. Uh, uh, his major complaints against competing apologetic methods are that they compromise the incomprehensibility of God. Continuing the quotation from Frame, the difference between the two, uh, between that is apologetics and theology, uh, because the, the context here indicates that, the difference between apologetics and theology in practice then becomes a difference in emphasis rather than in subject matter. Uh, I think you will find out as we go on that uh, my opinion is that Frame dilutes Van Til. He seems not to grasp Van Til's exact position and he sort of trivializes it. Now that's my opinion. You don't have to take it, but at least it'll help you understand the way I develop this. And well, to, uh, to go on uh, with the next page of frame, the logic of his position, that is Van Til's position, the logic of his position requires us to go beyond his explicit teachings to say more than he himself says. End of quote. And the frame proceeds to do so in one way or another. Since Van Til's theology is basically that of the Reformed tradition, Frame will mainly discuss his distinctives. Incidentally, Van Til's theology, I suppose you could say mainly or basically that of the Reformed, but not, not very, not always quite the same thing. Uh, he has a view of the Trinity that no theologian that I know, no orthodox theologian that I know of has ever come up with at all. Uh, he holds that God is not only three persons in one substance, to use that horrible Latin word that doesn't mean anything. He holds that God is both three persons and one person. And he explicitly denounces the usual apologetic defending the doctrine of the Trinity, which is that God is three in one sense and one in another sense, and hence there is no contradiction because there are lots of things that are three in one sense and one in another. You can get all sorts of examples. The easiest one to think of is a business corporation that has the three officers, the president, a vice president and a secretary treasurer. And here the corporation is one corporation but three officers. And you can have one godhead and three persons. There are all sorts of combinations where you have three and one, but in different senses. And that is the standard orthodox position all the way back from uh, Athanasius. Van Til denounces this and says that the Trinity is both one person and three persons. And he calls this a paradox, which is putting it mildly. Oh, uh, you'll have to read some other book I wrote to find the reference. You don't know what book you wrote? I can't remember what book I wrote what in. After all, I published some 25 books, and they are just one blooming, buzzing confusion in my mind. <laughs> so you do agree with that, don't you? <laughs> Uh, if you will look, if you will look at something I have published in the last three or four years, you'll find it somewhere. I can't remember. Well, Frame says, uh, since Van Til's theology is basically that of the Reformed tradition, Frame will mainly discuss his distinctives and. Uh, this uh, is the relation between unity and diversity. In fact, Frame says the relation between unity and diversity is 
and he puts this in italics, Van Til's most distinctive contribution to theology. And in doing this, uh, discussing unity and diversity, at times Van Til appears unequivocally to endorse the idea of system, uh, which I emphasize too, while at other times he seems to attack it. In favor of system, and you may remember that I emphasized system over and over again in my introductory lecture way back with it. <coughs> Three or four months ago we started this course, or three or four years ago, it seems so long. Uh, in favor of system is his view that God himself is exhaustively comprehensible to himself. All right, all right, fine. I'm sure God's mind is systematic, perfectly logical, and so on. And uh, Van Til, can, uh, well, Frame continues to quote Van Til. God's knowledge is systematic. There must be in God an absolute system of knowledge. That is Frame's, their Frame's words with reference to Van Til. And then he further goes on. We see then that our knowledge of the universe must be true since we are creatures of God who has made both us and the universe. Let me read that sentence again. This is frame sentence representing Van Til's view. Listen to it again. We see then that our knowledge of the universe must be true since we are creatures of God who has made both us and the universe. So well, now, if you can't guess what I'm going to say about that, you haven't been in the course very much or you've been asleep all the time. In the first place, that is an invalid inference. It's bad logic. Uh, God may have made us and yet our ideas may be false. In fact, a lot of our ideas are false. They often are. Of course, if we have knowledge, it is true. But this is a mere tautology. For example, Einstein says we have no knowledge of the universe. And so did Hume. And I'll read Van Til's sentence here, uh, frame sentence again. Our knowledge of the universe must be true since we are creatures of God who has made both us and the universe. But can you figure anything crazier than that? That's ridiculous. Some more quotes. With regard to the existence of God and the truth of Christian theism, there is absolutely certain proof. There is a cogent theistic proof. End of quote. Now, Frame's statement there is quite true. Van Til has said this over and over again. He doesn't accept Thomas's proof or any other proof, but he insists that there is an absolutely certain proof, a cogent theistic proof. And he uh, indicates that he means the cosmological proof, not the ontological proof. And for some 40 years now, I have been bugging him to show me the proof so I could see whether it was valid or not. He hasn't accommodated me as yet. <coughs> well, the next page of frame. These paragraphs sort of summarize, each paragraph summarizes about one page of Frame's article. A uh, quote from Frame. The Trinity is the heart of Christianity. 
And the doctrine of analogical knowledge is a corollary from the doctrine of the Trinity. Man's knowledge is true because, not in spite of, the fact that it is analogical. And then he winds up on a better note. All doctrines are interdependent. The parts depend on the whole, and the whole depends on the parts. Which is a good assertion that Christianity is a system. But uh, what are you going to make of the statement, man's knowledge is true because, not in spite of, the fact that it is analogical. And remember, for Van Til, a statement that is analogical has no univocal element in it whatever. <clears throat> and to repeat what I've already said three or four times, you cannot have an analogy unless there is at least one univocal point of similarity. And I gave you Aristotle's example of the medical man, the medical book, the medical instrument, and so on. Now, Frame quotes this. He has spent uh, several pages doing this from page, uh, say, 296 to page 304. You remember he began by saying that there are things in Van Til which... Uh, indicate that he is in favor of a system. He better be because his ordination vow said that he accepted the system of doctrine expounded in the Westminster Confession. Every minister in the OPC and in the PCA and in the RPCS uh, takes an ordination vow that he accepts the system of doctrine in the Westminster Confession. And so Van Til accepts the system. But says Frame, there are lots of things in Van Til that go contrary to that. There, there are portions of his work which are sort of anti-systematic. Van Til denies that Christianity is a deductive system. And to support this assertion, uh, Frame quotes this from, well, uh, I'm quoting from Frame. Our knowledge is analogical and therefore must be paradoxical. All teaching of scripture is apparently contradictory. All teaching of scripture is apparently contradictory. Uh, let me ask you, uh, is it somewhere said in the Old Testament that David was king of Israel? Is that apparently contradictory? And yet, Frame quotes Van Til as saying, all teaching of scripture is apparently contradictory. And the reason is that our knowledge is analogical and therefore must be paradoxical. Of course, he hasn't shown yet that we have any knowledge. That's one trouble. Quote, Van Til denies that the paradox of the three and one can be resolved by the formula one in essence and three in person. Rather, we do assert that God, that is the whole Godhead, is one person. Now, if you will get Frame's article, you'll find the reference in Van Til, which I don't have on this sheet of paper. So uh, I'm not the only one who uh, insists that Van Til says that God is one person and three persons. Frame admits that he says that. Now, uh, this section of frame is a section that picks out of Van Til those places where he seems to oppose the idea of systems. 
And uh, on page 307, Frame says this, The necessity and freedom of God's will are also paradoxically related. If God's will is directed by his intelligence, <coughs> then his free acts, creating the world, for example, become necessary. God had to create. If, on the other hand, God's free acts are truly free, then it would seem that they must be unconnected with his intelligence and therefore random. <coughs> I'll read that quotation again. This is Frame summarizing Van Til's position. This is not this is not the Van Til's. Uh, this is not a quotation from Van Til, though I rather suppose, uh, from what I know, uh, some of these phrases are Van Til's words, but he's put them together. <coughs> this is what he says: the necessity and freedom of God's will are also paradoxically related. If God's will is directed by His intelligence, then His free acts creating the world, for example, become necessary. God had to create. If, on the other hand, God's free acts are truly free, then it would seem that they must be unconnected with his intelligence and therefore random. Uh, the trouble with this uh, paragraph, which I've read a couple of times, is that uh, neither Frame nor Van Til define necessity nor freedom and certainly the phrase truly free and uh, therefore what is said here uh, really is not intelligible that beg pardon well uh, uh, I'll try to in the first place there are various kinds of freedom. Uh, we agree, don't we, that in this discussion we're not talking about political freedom. Uh, that's another kind. Uh, the Arminian doctrine of free will means that God cannot control our wills. Uh, we make our decisions quite apart from uh, any influence that God has on us. Or I'll define it this way, and I'm talking about human free will. Um, uh, free will is the, uh, is the equal ability to choose either of two exclusive uh, processes or acts uh, under uh, any given circumstance. And in saying this, I think I represent very accurately the position of the Arminians. Uh, that is their notion of freedom, and uh, it is, I think, recognized. The equal ability to choose either of two incompatible lines of action under one set of circumstances. Now, another kind of freedom, which you find discussed in the Middle Ages, is the freedom of the will from the intellect. Now, this is different from the Arminian point of view. They may overlap some, but it is different from the Arminian point of view. Uh, the freedom of the will from the intellect. Uh, that is, uh, you... Uh, you are you are able to uh, do what you what well, you are able to act in opposition to what you know, what you really believe. Yeah. I'm not sure he nowhere defines freedom. Uh, now, the absence of freedom, in, in this sense, would be indicated by Luther's volume on the bondage of the will. You remember Erasmus wrote a treatise on the freedom of the will, 
And um, Luther at first thought it was such a trivial affair that it wasn't worth paying any attention to. And then uh, Erasmus's friends uh, circulated the rumor that Luther had been defeated. He couldn't answer Erasmus. And uh, this uh, disturbed Luther's friends more than disturbed Luther, but they finally persuaded him that he had to answer Erasmus. And so he wrote one of the masterpieces of Christian theology, which I hope you all read, The Bondage of the Will. And of course, he and Calvin were absolutely in agreement on this. Now then, if you talk about freedom from, of God, uh, I suppose what a person ought to mean is that there is nothing external to God that controls him. But that doesn't seem to be what is meant here. Uh, here, the idea is that uh, God's will is independent of his intelligence. And this would make God schizophrenic. And... Uh, I don't think we want to say that. So uh, here, here are several definitions of freedom and uh, the quotation, and so far as I know anything else that Vance has written, uh, really does not define freedom. Uh, this, this sort of thing occurs in, in uh, the controversy which Vance and I engaged in for some years. Uh, he, he would say that I make logic superior to God. Well, that's sort of nonsense. Uh, logic is the way God thinks. And God, God, God's thinking isn't superior to him. If that's the way he is. And uh, so uh, these, these words are not defined. And you see, you see uh, frame falls into em uh, embarrassing language. Because after, after he talks about God's freedom, then he, sa he has to enforce it a little bit by saying truly free. Now that doesn't add anything. That simply shows that the man's embarrassed. Now I, I, I must make this statement with a little hesitation because I'm not quite sure of it. But so far as I know, the last philosopher who tried to keep God's will and his intellect distinct was Descartes, who lived in the 17th century. And uh, this attempt on his part seemed to have failed. And, uh, well, maybe some Arminians have tried to do it. I don't know, but uh, at any rate, I don't know. That is the last attempt that I know of uh, to distinguish between God's will and God's intellect. So if you uh, insist on a, a very unified personality, uh, you, uh, you don't have that uh, duality. Well, I'll read some more. These are very interesting things. If we're going to get over this, uh, it's only 10 pages, but I've already taken an hour, have I? Oh, I'm, <coughs> I'm only up to page four. Yeah, just an hour, four pages an hour. I am a speed reader. Now, coming back to frame. Does, uh, this is a question he asks uh, when he wants to give Van Til's answer. Does God's plan include evil? And frame answers for Van Til. Does God's plan include evil? Yes and no. But he doesn't explain why he says no. The, the yes is correct, of course. God's plan includes everything. And uh, you will see in Isaiah, the 45th chapter in the 7th verse, that God creates evil. And why anybody should say no can only be explained on the basis that he pays no attention to the scriptures. Yeah, <clears throat> the original edition of uh, the Schofield Bible uh, had a note on Isaiah 45.7 <clears throat> and the note said this. The Hebrew word ra which is the word in the 
the, the note is this. The, the Hebrew word ra is never translated sin. He was referring, of course, to the King James Version. The Hebrew word ra is never translated sin. Now, the remarkable point about that note is that it's absolutely true. Now, how would a person know that the Hebrew word ra is never translated sin in the Old Testament, since that's the Hebrew? How would you get to know that? Huh? How much of the Hebrew text? And, of course, all the text of the King James Version, too. Yeah. So you couldn't make that statement unless you had examined every case, wouldn't you? Well, in any case, however you do it. Yeah, of course, the concordance has done most most of the work for you. Now then, if if Schofield examined every case of Ra in the Old Testament, he must have known that Ra means murder, adultery, theft, lying, and uh, all sorts of sins. And yet he said it's never translated sin. That's right, it isn't. But it refers to murder, adultery, theft, False witness, covetousness, all sin. I am I am making the linguistic assertion that the word ra refers to all sorts of sins, and uh, as for some suggestion that you make, if you will continue with the verses in Isaiah, you will find that. Uh, <coughs> The following verse refers to peace. And if you look at it in the context, it isn't peace between, say, Israel and Syria or something like that. It's peace with God. And so if evil and peace are contrasted, and if peace means spiritual peace with God, then Ra means sin. But Schofield didn't want to say that. So he said something that was perfectly true and completely misleading. Another, another example of Van Til's rejection of systematic theology. The image of God in man is both lost and retained. To quote, the image is lost in some sense, and also remains in some sense. In incidentally, I'm, this is a verbatim quotation. Uh, this, I'm not making this, I'm not summarizing it all. This is, these are frame zone words, uh, including the little parenthesis in some sense. The image is lost in some sense and also remains in some sense. Since the precise senses, and this is still frames wording, since the precise senses are not specified, we are left with a paradoxical formulation. <coughs> uh, let me read that over again. The image, that is the image of God. And really you shouldn't talk about the image of God in man. The scripture says man is the image of God. The image of God isn't something that happens to be in man with a lot of other things. Man himself is the image of God. Uh, well, I'll read this. The image is lost in some sense and also remains in some sense. Since the precise senses are not specified, we are left with a paradoxical formulation. End of quote. And furthermore, not only is there no paradox, contrary to what Frame says, but the senses are specified. He says they're not. Well, the, the scriptures specify the senses in which the image, uh, well, I wouldn't say the image is lost. Uh, and most of the Reformed theologians do not say the image is lost. They say it's deformed and point out very clearly that it's not lost. So... Uh, a person who says they are 
not specified is a little arrogant, I think, for he implies that if he does not see it in Scripture, no one else can. And uh, some, some very humble people are terribly arrogant. Now, uh, so far, Frame has shown certain places in Van Til where he seems to assert system, and some places in Van Til where he is, is, uh, appears to uh, reject system. Now then, uh, Frame wants to somehow tie these together, and uh, one of the subheads, uh, the third subhead, is the analogical system. The apparent contradictions require an analogical system. Quote, Analogous reasoning is reasoning which presupposes as its ultimate basis the reality of the biblical God. Let me read this definition of analogical reasoning again. Analogous reasoning is reasoning which presupposes as its ultimate basis the reality of the biblical God. Well, I don't know why I don't know why insisting on the reality of the biblical God makes your reasoning analogical, but that's what he says. Well, to go on, God is both the source and the interpreter of all facts. Quote, Man does not ultimately determine the nature and meaning of the world. End of quote. Which is a very trivial statement to make. I mean, nobody denies it. Man does not ultimately determine the nature and meaning of the world. We think God's thoughts after him. And he also says we reinterpret. We don't interpret the world on our own. We reinterpret it. And uh, he says we think God's thoughts after him. Uh, the question here is if that is so, how do we know that our reinterpretation is correct? Uh, since since God is omniscient, I suppose every theologian who is even halfway orthodox would say that uh, our thinking must conform to God's thought if it is to be true. But uh, how do we know? How do we know our reinterpretation conforms to uh, God's thought? Well, Frame goes on with something that amuses me a little bit. You'll find this on page 313 of his uh, little booklet. It's, uh, this is the problem of theological paradox. It's chapter 11 in Foundations of Christian Scholarship, edited by Gary North. And so he continues, this precipitated the Clark case. I'm the Clark, of course. You, uh, if any of you don't know it, uh, I was ordained in the OPC in 1944 and uh, a certain group of Westminster people uh, filed a complaint in General Assembly trying to have my ordination revoked. And uh, this, was, this controversy took about five years and I won, but... Uh, that's, that's the Clark case. This precipitated the Clark case. It had to do with Van Til's statement that there is no identity of content between what God has in mind and what man has in mind. Now, that's, uh, that, those words come from, uh, from frame. The, uh, the actual words, Van Til's words, and uh, Kushke's and... Uh, uh, well, several others uh, who signed the complaint. The exact words are, 
God's knowledge, or maybe it's the knowledge that God has, something like that, God's knowledge and the knowledge possible to man do not coincide at any single point. God's knowledge and the knowledge possible to man do not coincide at any single point. Now, Frame continues, God's concept of a rose is different in content from man's because God's concept is the original and ours is derivative. But uh, the word content in this sentence is uh, considerably ambiguous. And in fact, Frame himself lists six different meanings of the word content. Uh, Frame does not repeat the charges that were made in the Clark case. Uh, he doesn't repeat the... Uh, any of the uh, reply, but at any rate, he does not he does not repeat the main sentence in the uh, complaint. The complaint was a document complaining against my ordination. He doesn't repeat this sentence, which is the key sentence. Uh, the uh, knowledge of God and the knowledge possible to man do not coincide at any single point. Therefore, Frame cannot urge that Van Til means only one or two of the six meanings of content and does not mean the others. Van Til said at any single point. And if Frame comes along and says, well, there are six meanings of content, and maybe man's knowledge and God's knowledge uh, coincide at one or two of these six, but not the others, that is ruled out by Van Til. He said not at any single point. And hence it's useless for, uh, for um, Van Til to say that the word content has six different meanings. Well, going on from that, he comes to a subsection on an analogy and revelation. Quote, Van Til rather affirms that we can have no knowledge of God unless he voluntarily reveals himself. Well, so, that does not require our concept to differ from God's. It simply means that God reveals his knowledge to us. Then we have his knowledge. Frame insists that we can derive knowledge from an observation of nature. And he's, the quotation is, extra scriptural information to interpret scripture. As we, we need, or at least we use, extra scriptural information to interpret scripture. But neither he nor Van Til explain how this is possible. This is a big gap in their theory. But Frame insists, quote, thus we can use such data fearlessly and thankfully. That is, we can use extra scriptural information fearlessly and thankfully. Uh, does that mean that we should hold to the discarded theory of gravitation? Does it hold? That, does it mean that we should hold to the uh, to Newtonian's idea that uh, motion proceeds in a straight line? <coughs> does it mean that we must accept Einstein, who says motion never proceeds in a straight line, and that there is no gravitation? Is space and time, are space and time independent frameworks, as Newton said? Or are they not independent, as Einstein said? And who knows what the science will be a year from now? Now, Frame admits that man's knowledge of nature is distorted by sin. Quote, 
man's normal activity of interpreting the universe has been distorted by sin. Well, in that case, how can we use it fearlessly and thankfully? But uh, I am not particularly interested in the distortion of knowledge by sin. Uh, I, I do admit no edict effects of sin, however. Uh, but uh, uh, my, my theory is that even Adam, before he fell, could never have arrived at any laws of nature whatever. Because our physical abilities do not enable us to do that. And uh, laboratory experimentation uh, is uh, an imposition of mathematical choices on observations that do not compel any particular proposition. Continuing to quote from Frame, even when we use extra scriptural information as we must, that's part of his wording, even when we use extra scriptural information as we must to understand scripture, we must hold loosely to this information. Oh, I thought he said, I thought he said on the previous page, we can use it fearlessly and thankfully. Now he says we have to use it loosely. And if we use it loosely, then uh, even loosely we must reject the principle that scripture must be interpreted by scripture which I think is the Reformed position. And, of course, this matter of loosely, that just wrecks Frame's whole scheme. Now, further, on page 321, quote, Our knowledge is limited both by our created status and by God's sovereign limitation of revelation. Therefore, we can expect to find paradox also in Scripture. Let me read this remarkable example of logic again. Our knowledge is limited both by our created status and by God's sovereign limitation of revelation. Well, I have no objection to that sentence. But look what he implies from, what he infers from it. Therefore, we can expect to find paradox also in Scripture. Now, that's perfectly fallacious. The therefore doesn't hold at all. Now, it is no doubt true that there are apparent contradictions in Scripture, but only apparent ones. We have to ask, apparent to whom? They appear ultimately irreconcilable to unbelievers because unbelievers have a false view of the foundations of logic. But the apparent contradictions are also apparent to all men, believers and unbelievers. Wait a minute, I get, wait till I get the, uh, I, I better do this over again. This, this is all quotation. I, I think maybe you thought I was speaking for myself. Uh, this, these are Frame's words, I'll go through them. There are apparent contradictions in scripture, but only apparent ones. Apparent to whom? They appear ultimately irreconcilable to unbelievers because unbelievers have a false view of the foundation of logic. But the apparent contradictions are also apparent to all men, believers and unbelievers alike, because of their finitude. End of quote. Well, many unbelievers will admit uh, consistency in places where frame finds paradoxes. This is more often the case with believers. A paradox, in my opinion, at any rate, 
a paradox is simply a confusion in one's mind. And hence what is paradoxical to one man is not paradoxical to another. And my standard example of this is the physics laboratory, an elementary laboratory, where the professor will tell you that uh, the weight of water in this container is half the weight of the water in this container. And yet the pressure with the lesser water is twice the pressure with a, a twice the pressure of the greater amount of water. And that sounds queer to some people. They ask this, some of the students, say, well, how can, how can water, which is half the weight of another uh, beaker of water, have twice the pressure on the bottom? This is a paradox. This is one that's very easily solved. Any of you know the solution? Had, you've had physics? Yeah, tell them. Exactly, yes. Pressure is a function of height, not of weight. Uh, but most people make a mistake and think it's a function of the weight. And uh, but uh, two of us here don't see any paradox anymore. Now Van Til, this is a footnote that Frame has. Van Til suggests that the contradiction appears only at first sight. Elsewhere, he seems to argue that it is irresolvable by any created intellect. That is, there are paradoxes in the Bible that we can't possibly untangle. Van Til sometimes uses deduction, sometimes forbids it, but never explains when one rather than the other is the case. And of course, that's just the trouble with Van Til, isn't it? Omnipotence is not paradoxical, for nothing in Scripture contradicts it. God's sovereignty and man's responsibility are paradoxical, and to remove that contradiction would be to compromise either God's sovereignty or man's responsibility. Let me read this over again. I'll tell you where the quotation begins. I have summarized a little bit before the quotation begins. The summary is like this. Omnipotence is not paradoxical, for nothing in Scripture contradicts it. Although on another page he says everything in Scripture is paradoxical. Omnipotence is not paradoxical, for nothing in Scripture contradicts it. God's sovereignty and man's responsibility are paradoxical. Quote, to remove that contradiction would be to compromise either God's sovereignty or man's responsibility, end of quote. But if omnipotence, these are my words, if omnipotence is not paradoxical, as Frame said above, quote, what are we to make of his statement that all teaching of Scripture is apparently contradictory? Now that's Frame's statement about Van Til, I would suppose that Van Til might say this, but at any rate, that's the way Frame understands Van Til. No, in fact, this is a quotation from Van Til. There's a double quotation here. These two things, I mean, Frame's frame statement. What are, what are we to make of his statement that all teaching of Scripture is apparently contradictory? Question mark. Uh, he, uh, Van Til uh, said that uh, omnipotence is not self-contradictory, but uh, the creation and responsibility are contradictory. And uh, also he said all teaching of Scripture is apparently contradictory, which would, of course, include uh, the idea of omnipotence. Our concepts are limiting concepts. Now here Van Til misuses language for Kant means something quite different. The word limiting concept arose with Kant and it has a certain meaning. 
uh, Van Til takes the phrase but uses it in a different sense and it's hard to know what he means. It's something like this. Limiting concept means merely that there are some things we do not know about a tree, for example. It merely means that our knowledge is not exhaustive. Well, that's not what anybody in philosophy meant by a limiting concept. And furthermore, here Van Til thinks of things, like a tree, as being an object of knowledge. His confusion vanishes if we take propositions to be the objects of knowledge. If, interpreting, if in interpreting scripture, putting the two verses together produces an apparent contradiction, then so be it, end of quote. You're, you're doing some exegesis, and you come up against the, an apparent contradiction. Well, all right, let it stand. Uh, don't examine your interpretation to see what mistake you've made. Just let it stand. Quote, The doctrine of justification by faith, when fully explained in its relation to the rest of scriptural truth, is just as paradoxical as divine sovereignty. Even the omnipotence of God, then, shares with other doctrines a paradoxical element. And, of course, a, a few pages before he said it wasn't paradoxical. And then we have the final statement, well, near the final. All teaching of Scripture is apparently contradictory. All teaching of Scripture, that's verbatim, all teaching of Scripture is apparently contradictory. I might say that the statement David was a king of Israel is not apparently contradictory to me. Now a sort of a conclusion. <clears throat> yeah. Quote, Logic has made only small steps in this task, describing the conditions of intelligibility for a few key terms like all, if, then, and so on, only in certain narrowly defined contexts. For example, man has, in one sense, and has not, in another, lost the image of God as the result of the fall. Since the senses are not clearly specifiable, we have an apparent contradiction. End of quote. Similar to what was said before. And even my remark is, even if the senses were not specifiable, there would not be an apparent contradiction anyway. And further, they are specifiable. And then there's a little paragraph that winds it up nicely, and that's the end. This concludes Dr. Clark's lecture entitled John Frame and Cornelius Van Til.